Since time immemorial, whether in the East or West, women have been expected only to be beautiful or fulfill their duty as wives and mothers. For a long time, even though women were visible in many spheres of life, their main role was as the behind-the-scene helpers of successful men or as keepers of the household. In many countries, a woman's destiny is decided by her father or other male relatives. The majority of women have positions as carers or as companions for men. However, the acquisition of knowledge has expanded women's horizons. The first girls' school in Taiwan was founded by missionary Dr. George Leslie McKay in 1884. The school gave women the opportunity to receive an education, challenging the traditional Chinese idea that an uneducated woman is a virtuous one. For 40 years now, Taiwan has had nine years of compulsory education for both sexes, allowing men and women equal opportunity to receive an education. The feminist movement in the 1960s in the West encouraged many educated young women in Taiwan to speak out on the concept of gender equality. They campaigned for women's rights in Taiwan calling for equal educational, employment, and political rights. Today, we can see exceptional women in all areas of Taiwanese society. Taiwanese women are moving from the background to the fore. From the early 19th century, women in the West began to call for emancipation. It was only after a century of struggle that they gained the right to suffrage. With the promulgation of the Constitution in 1947, women in the ROC gained the right to vote. Before 1980, Taiwan had never had a female cabinet member. In 2000, however, women accounted for more than 20% of all cabinet members. Also in that year, Taiwan's first female vice president was elected. Taiwan currently has the highest percentage of female legislators in Asia. Today, many outstanding women are involved in government in Taiwan. During the martial law period, not all seats in the legislative yuan were contested in elections. I remember that at that time, there were only four female legislators, but now there are 47. Another outstanding achievement is that 35% of Taiwan's city and county councilors are women. The high social status enjoyed by Taiwan's women matches any of our economic achievements, and because of this, Taiwan is number one in Asia. Today, Taiwan's women live in an era of gender parity, thanks to 30 years of effort by individuals and private groups. Gender equality in Taiwan had its beginning with the burgeoning of the women's movement in the 1970s. The women's movement and the seed of feminism in Taiwan was initiated by Annette Liu in 1972. 
largely by her own effort, Yu founded Pioneer Publishing and started up the Women's Protection Hotline, helping many women at the time. Taiwanese society was very conservative at that time. Whenever I published a book, it was quickly banned because my view was considered unorthodox. One of my works, Counting the Footsteps of the Pioneer, contains a collection of writings, some articles by me criticizing male chauvinism, and some actual letters condemning my views as a record of those feudal and conservative times, as well as essays of my opinions on gender issues and critiques of inequality. Liu had been imprisoned, and her partners at the Women's Protection Hotline and Pioneer Publishing, such as Li Yuanzhen and Bo Qingrong, were worried that the movement would die. So Li Yuanzhen got together a group of friends, and they discussed how to keep the movement going. They decided to found a magazine. In 1982, Taiwan's first feminist magazine was published. Awakening, which was brought out on a regular basis, carried legal commentaries on women's human rights, as well as articles on numerous issues such as women's potential and development, legalization of abortion, women's personal autonomy, and developing work opportunities for women. It also became a barometer for women's opinions. The women's movement didn't take a step backward after Annette Liu was imprisoned after the Kaohsiung incident. However, we all learned to take a softer approach, choosing a strategy that the government at the time wouldn't oppose. This strategy was using the magazine to organize events to promote our concepts. We did that right up until the end of martial law. During that period, we worked to save teenage prostitutes. When, in July 1987, martial law was lifted, we reorganized into a foundation. Many women's groups were established thereafter. Awakening served as a vehicle linking the women's movements past and present in Taiwan. Between its founding in 1982 and the end of martial law in 1987, Awakening was the only base of operations for the women's movement in Taiwan. Awakening pushed the movement forward extremely cautiously, but determinedly. Our first experience with rescuing teenage prostitutes was in 1987. Public protests were impossible during that time, so we cooperated with indigenous people, churches, and underground women's organizations. Our first action was launched with songs and slogans calling for these prostituted girls to be let out. The riot police were standing on the street. The mob had hidden the girls from us and were standing outside the building waiting to see what we were up to. This being our first attempt, we decided to employ a gentle approach to get those girls to call out for help to come out. After the lifting of martial law, when the Garden of Hope Foundation marched for teenage prostitutes, government officials started walking at the head of these processions. But by that time, the situation had totally changed. <laughs> 